I come to this house to respond to a challenge by Minister Shamugam to debate on Seka. It has been puzzling me because it was in reference to his remarks made on a racial incident which has nothing to do with Seka. The very fact that he linked the incident to Seka was both disingenuous and troubling. The Prime Minister also, in his National Day Rally speech, claimed that those who questioned Seka, wanting to put Singaporeans first, had a strong racial undertone. Minister Wong also re reiterated many of those accusations throughout his speech, his two speeches today. But when I asked Minister Shamugam for instances where I've, where I've commented about Seka prior to accepting his challenge, he can't reply me. He went on to ask me a few other questions, but he didn't reply me. So these are clearly attempts by, the by this government pu to put a label on those seeking more information disclosure and more objective discussion on SECA as racist and xenophobic. I think I'll leave that issue as it is. We have done all our explanation that we are not racist or xenophobic. At the end of the day, Justice is in the heart of the people. The people will decide. Political labels are convenient to use to discredit someone, but they are not helpful for an open and objective discussion. By the way, I have also to ob object to Minister Tan Si Ling Words just now saying that PSP is attacking foreigners. Maybe it's a slip of his tongue, but I have to correct that. All of us here today have one common objective, and that is to improve the job prospects and livelihood of Singaporeans. And I've stayed focused on that objective. So let me reiterate that we are neither racist nor xenophobic, and this debate is squarely about jobs and livelihoods of our PMETs, who are adversely affected by the foreign talent policy. The provisions on people movement in FTAs like SECA are only a small part of a much larger problem. To be clear, we need foreign talent. We, they play an important role in complementing, transferring skill and knowledge, as well as providing opportunities for cross-fertilization of ideas. But those that are brought in and mass under the EP and SP schemes are not, by definition, really foreign talent. They are foreign professionals let in without quota, resulting in displacement of our own workforce. By drawing on Mr. Go Chok Tong's definition of mediocrity, a foreign talent should be one who earns more than $500,000 a year or $40,000 a month. While we do need foreign talent, more importantly, we need to protect our Singaporean core. And what is the Singaporean core? It is simply our citizens, natural or new, who recite our Singapore pledge and whose interest the government has the prime responsibility to look after. The current policies have seriously hollowed out our core. In many key industries, our PMET core is no longer the dominant force that we can rely on for long-term growth. The very people that can ensure the future of our country are being displaced and hollowed out. 
It has been a long debate, and we have covered a lot of ground, a lot, a lot of ground. However, as expected, the government stands on the causes and the severity of the problem we are facing, or the Singaporeans are facing, is very different from ours. As a result, probably the new policies that the government is going to come out with will not solve the problems thoroughly, and Singaporean sufferings may have to go on. We might have to come back one year later again and debate on the same problem. Singaporeans would note that PSP has done our best to convince this government. Let me go through the differences between the government position and PSP position. First, the government says displacement due to globalized and fast-changing world. PSP say a large part is due to work pass holders. Two, the displacement problem is not serious, the government says. PSP says probably a lot more serious. Coming back to the 380,000 PME jobs the Manpower Minister had presented to us in the July 6 ministerial statement, we are trying to ask him, are you sure that this number represents a net job creation for Singaporeans? So there were some exchanges just now with my colleague Hazel Poir as well. There was no conclusion. But let me just share some numbers with you. 380,000 PME jobs created for locals, and that is for both Singaporeans and PRs. From 2005 to, two, from, to 2020. But during the same period, 600,000 PRs has been awarded to work pass holders. So the reclassification is likely to be a significant factor. But we don't know what is the number because we don't have the number from the government. On top of that, there were 400,000 university and polytechnic graduates during that period. So a million people seeking job versus 380,000 jobs created. So I don't know how to reconcile the numbers, but maybe in other future forums, we can continue to discuss that. Number three, governments say emphasis is on training and retraining Singaporeans. PSP say better prevent job displacement first. Let the foreigners do the skills transfer. Because once a person is displaced, it's difficult for him to find a new job. It is so easy to say, train again, take up the, the, the challenge and all that. The examples you quote, I'm sure, is a small minority of those Singaporeans who can really change to a new industry and learn new skills. Number four, governments say, Distribute, uh, discrimination is sporadic. PSP say probably is structural. We have to look at it. Because the foreign work pass holders has been in Singapore in large numbers for the last 20 years. And they are a very influential force in the job market. So if you want to ratify the discriminative situation in the job market, that legislation may be too slow. Number five, foreign talent create jobs, say the government. But PSP say, the work pass holders we are attracting are all average work pass holders. Where do they have the ability to create jobs? So they are just here to share our jobs. So the jobs done by them, most of it can be done by Singaporeans as well. So in that sense, Professor Hoon's lump of labor fallacy may not apply. Number six, 
And uh, member Mr. Patrick Tay also mentioned this, that there's a lot of resistance from employers if we want to change the foreigners' policy. Of course, that is expected, because after all, they are profit seekers. But PSP say, how long can we kick the can down the road? At some point, we have to change. And this is a golden opportunity, because now we can tell the employers, work harder. We can give you the quota now, but make sure you promise to scale down your people in three years' time. This is the opportunity to convince the employers to work together and we change the cost of our economy. If not, our economy will continue to be stuck in a low value add position. Lastly, governments say you send wrong signal to foreigners. PSB say as long as we Singaporeans are united, government and alternative parties all united and say we have to change course. I don't think foreigners can say much. Because that is the way we have chosen. And I don't think the foreigners are, foreigners are here just because we, don't, we give them work passes. They are here to make, they make a business decision and a strategy. There are many factors involved. Work passes are just one of the factors. And in fact, afterwards I will elaborate on, my, on our policy recommendations. We are not saying that you don't allow the foreign companies to come in with the number of work passes they want initially, but it must be transitional. There must be localization over time. We cannot allow them to continue to keep the same number of foreigners from the very day they come in. So as long as we are united, I think we can put the message nicely to the foreigners. After all, we can set up a fair consideration framework for foreigners. Why should a fair consideration framework for Singaporeans? That is something, as a Singaporean, I feel very puzzled. An interesting point was brought up by Ms. Uh, Janet Ang. I respect uh, Janet as a senior executive in the private sector. She mentioned that Singaporeans didn't have the re relevant skills, work knowledge, and global experience. But I would like to say, if Singaporeans continue to be uprooted from their jobs, where do we get the opportunity to accumulate the skills and know-how over time? Like I said just now, you cannot expect the Singaporeans to pick up new skills all the time. Are you going to say that if foreigners come in and replace the Singaporeans because it's low cost, the Singaporeans lost a job and then he has, go, he has to go and uh, uh, acquire a new skill again? No. Skills and know-how, and that comes to our capabilities of our economy. The whole foreign talent policy, as far as we can see up to now, contribute little to our capability building. Partly because our Singaporean core is being affected. Our Singaporean core are no longer learning over time in the same job. They'll be displaced. Another thing I, asked, uh, I want to uh, uh, point out to Janet is that we hope the top managers in Singapore would also understand that and support the Singaporeans and not keep saying Singaporeans don't have this, don't have that, because they are now in, under a system that do not have the incentives to make them work hard, to make them work in the way we want them to uh, uh, take up the challenge and all that. Okay. Those prospects existed in our generation, Janet. In this generation, it's more challenging. And now, 
the leadership of the country has brought in an additional trouble for them, and that is competition. Not that we want to avoid competition, but as I've said before in my speech, the competition was not really fair to start with. So other than the discriminatory structure that we talk about in the job market, actually our economy now is also in a very different operating structure, thanks to the 20 years of foreign talent policy. It will not be easy to transform. We know that. Like a GLC senior manager who is a friend, a very close friend, recently shared with me, ah, if you want me to overhaul my whole system now, it will be very high cost because it's totally dependent on foreigners now. But I think we still have to make the change. If together we have a consensus, we can rope in a lot of initiatives, a lot of resources, we can give each other time, employers, workers, but I think we need to make the change. The next I want to comment about is from Mr. Satyandi, who mentioned that Singaporeans have, are now very active in the global financial markets. Well, I like to hear that, but I also like to remind him, we Singaporeans have been in the forefront of the financial markets since the 1980s. I started work in GIC in 1986. Before that, many of my seniors, not just in GIC, but seniors in the financial sector in Singapore, were pioneers in financial innovations in New York. They go to New York and they make the innovation. Some of the innovations were interest rate swaps and all the equity and bond derivatives. I'm not so capable, but I set up one of the first derivative, uh, equity derivative desks in Tokyo in 1987. And Mr. Satyandi mentioned about my PR recommendation. Uh, I recommend to control the number, manage the number down. But he didn't read my uh, recommendation correctly, I actually say the recommendation is for work pass holders. So I'm in support of Singaporeans with foreign spouses and give the PR to the foreign spouses. I'm in support of that. But for this recommendation, I'm referring to PR and citizenship to the work pass holders. So to reiterate, PSP's position. One, we think the foreign talent is not a silver bullet to solve all our problems. Two, the foreign talent policy is the root cause of the influx of foreigners, and that has caused a significant number of displacement of Singaporeans. Three, unfair wage competition is the main economic driver of the displacement. Four, decisive and concrete measures is now needed to rebalance our job market. Four, five, and lastly, the FTAs and SECA are part of the equation when we consider immigration and employment policies. And unless the government can provide new information to prove otherwise. Unfortunately, as of today, we still cannot agree that SECA is net beneficial to Singapore. Next, I'd like to address the policy recommendations that I've made. In reply to Minister Lawrence Wong and also Minister Dan Siling. First of all, PSP is for an open economy and society. So our policy recommendations are not meant to make Singapore 
a closed society or economy. And our policy recommendations are meant to make a point, a point that all of us agree upon, upon that we change course. We have to change course. But after we have agreed to that, I would think that we can throw in or rope in a lot of other things and provide the leeway for us to implement those policies. They need not be cast in stone. And among the policies that I've recommended, only the price-related policies, or I call price control policies, has got a time frame. For the quota policies, I have purposely made it no time constraint. I hope you notice that. Okay, in terms of the policy, firstly, I think we really need to eliminate the wage disadvantage against Singaporeans. Hence, the, the EP levy. I don't think Minister Tan Si Ling twice attempt to reply to my EP levy as a necessity to equalize the compensation package of the World Pass holders of the EP and Singaporean, really answer the question. Because the 17% CPF, employer CPF contribution, is a differential. It's a direct differential. You cannot, you cannot avoid that. And being an, 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 an employer, that will go into his decision making. B. In order to attract more foreign talent, the government also agreed that the qualifying salaries should go up. So it's just a matter of how fast. My policy may be a bit faster. C. I did not put any time limit to reduce the headcount of World Pass holders. Although I would like, actually today, we can come to some conclusion as to what is the number of displaced Singaporeans. So that becomes a target that we can work on. But since the government claims there's, no, uh, there's very few displacement, then we will not discuss that anymore. But I didn't put uh, any time limit to reducing the headcount. Okay. I also didn't put any time limit to reducing the single nationality number. Okay, but all this, there is an aspirational or planning target that maybe we should put a 10% cap on the single nationality and that. So what I'm trying to say is the policies that PSP has recommended Actually, we are very mindful of the effect and the implementation, the effect of the implementation has on the employment market, on the job market, and also directly, what kind of, or indirectly, what kind of messages we are sending to foreigners. Next. We also have to reflect how the problems of the foreign talent policy has been allowed to fester, develop, and exist for the last 20 years. It tells us a lot about the checks and balances in our governance system. In particular, we have to question the freedom of information, tripartite partnership, and the conduct of our government. First, freedom of information. Throughout this long-running saga on the foreign talent policy, accurate data has been lacking, which has contributed to the large amount of fake news and speculation floating around. In my own experience of preparing for this debate, I cannot find the figures on intra-corporate transferees. Of course, today, Minister provided 
a few more years. But the thing is, why just give out piecemeal? You are the one who is generating the data. You should be putting the data in an organized format. Yes, we agree that some data may be sensitive, but please put it in an organized format for people to analyze. There are so many, so many people in Singapore who will be able to analyze, who will be able to analyze the data if the data are presented regularly and in an organized manner. Like today, Minister Tan Siling provided, a, 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 I would say, quite a lot of new data, but the new data are not actually available for us to analyze without him telling us. So the way the government is doing is what I call guerrilla data, you know. Whenever they want to prove a point, they give you a few more data. You look at the, the chart that uh, Minister Tan Siling has given us, below put labor survey report. That is available. After that, administrative data from the research department of MOM, M-O-M. So without the administrative data, we don't have the whole picture. Dr. Tan Cheng Bok has called for transparency, accountability, and independence in matters of national governance. Singaporeans have the right to information in order to make informed opinions and judgment. We urge the government to introduce the Freedom of Information Act as soon as possible. Although we are not the first one to raise this, Workers' Party has always been talking about this, and we thank them for that. The parliament also has a constitution role to play in ensuring that sufficient information is provided and policies are thoroughly debated. To this end, we recommend the setting up of Standing Parliamentary Select Committee in every ministry with representatives from both the ruling and alternative parties to improve information flow, to facilitate more substantial policy deliberation. And policy delib deliberation is about an integrated deliberation. It is not just a legal interpretation. It is more social economic analysis, but on top of that, philosophy, history, how human beings have behaved over history. Those are important things for policy making. The second point I want to make is tripartism. Tripartism has been practiced since independence. However, in my opinion, the weak NTUC link in the tripartite partnership has become obvious during the foreign talent policy saga. I believe Mr. Patrick Tay and all the NTUC leadership and the NTUC staff are working very hard. But if the overall policy is pointing at a different direction, the results that come out of their hard work speaks for themselves. Lowly paid workers constantly leading, needing governmental financial support to get by, despite working full time. PMETs in their 40s and 50s finding themselves extremely vulnerable to discrimination and now underemployment. So NTUC needs a lot of soul searching if it still wants to be relevant in representing the interest of the Singaporean workers. We also urge Singaporean employers to stand up against discrimination. They will have the most to lose in the long run, in the long term, if the current situa situation leads to a radical change of our business culture and mode of operation without a robust, a robust Singaporean core. 
We urge employers to take the lead in rooting out discrimination in the job market so that we can build a competitive, yet fair, multicultural and multinational workforce with Singaporeans at the core. Lastly, conduct of government. The government needs to show more empathy rather than lip service in order to understand the psychic and the real experiences of the working citizens. Many of them are struggling. Even if one Singaporean is being discriminated, we should take action. Let's not argue about majority widespread or not widespread. Every Singaporean will have a duty to make sure he's not discriminated in the job market. Over the years, while Singaporeans have constantly provided feedback on the predicament, the government has insisted that all attempts in trying to curb immigration and foreign workforce growth in order to safeguard Singaporeans will end up hurting the Singaporeans themselves. I quote Dr. Amy Kaur from her speech at the White Paper debate in February 2013, quote, to curb immigration or foreign workforce growth in order to safeguard Singaporeans could, in an ironic twist, hurt the very people this reversal is intended to help, unquote. I wonder what Dr. Amy Kaur has to say now. Before the ironic twist has happened, the silver bullet unleashed by the foreign talent policy had actually shot down many Singaporeans' livelihood and may hit Singapore soon. Well, time is a powerful weakness. When Singaporeans' anxiety has persisted for the last 10 to 20 years, I think it is difficult to justify that the current policy is not fraud. Honourable members of this House, contrary to, the, contrary to the original promises presented in the Population White Paper, the foreign talent policy has created in Singapore an imbalanced population with a diluted national identity, an economy with inadequate technological innovation and significant displacement of Singaporean workers. This has been a debate that many Singaporeans are concerned with and anxiously waiting for. This is not just a debate about a particular section of SECA, nor has it anything to do with racism and xenophobia. It is a debate about elevating the plight of our PMETs adversely affected by the foreign talent policy. It is a debate about the need to safeguard the Singaporean core, which is the pillar of our economy and our future. It is a debate about developing our very own talent by looking into new ideas to create opportunities for them. The PSP position is clear. We recognize the need to stay open as an economy. We are pro-trade, but not free for all trade. We recognize the need for real foreign talent to complement our Singaporean core, transferring skills as well as sharing experiences. But we want a healthy balance of foreign and local workforce, achieved through sound immigration and employment policies. We want these policies to be designed and executed fairly, with Singaporean interest first. We call for urgent and concrete steps to be taken to alleviate the current problems. And we have given suggestions what need to be done. The Prime Minister has said in his National Day message that he recognises the anxieties about jobs, that his government will make changes over time. 
But time is of essence. The changes must start now, before this dire situation gets to a point of no return. Many of us have heard or read about the story of Mr. Philip Wang, whom I happen to know. He was a senior vice president of a bank, but now has to drive grab for a living. Please don't be mistaken. There's nothing wrong with driving a grab, as it is an honorable job. But this is a good illustration of underemployment, which many of our PMETs are facing. Their skill sets could not could have been much better. Their skill sets could have been much better utilized. Yet they are forced into a no-win situation. There are many more sad stories, as we discover through our survey of 750 PMET respondents. It pains us to know that we have our own talents that are not treasured, and the very government that is supposed to look after their interest has their priority elsewhere, maybe economic growth. Mr. Speaker, sir, let me close by reminding that democracy is famously described as government of the people, by the people, for the people. So let's not forget that it is the interest of the people that the members of this House and this government are elected to serve. There's nothing wrong in voicing out for them and championing for them. Singaporeans deserve better. The many Philip Wang out there deserve better. For country, for people. Sir, I beg to move the motion. Thank you.